So in the last lecture, we introduced the concept of a normal mode, uh, which consider uh, a chain of uh, interacting oscillators. And we found out that they do have collective uh, oscillatory modes, which are called as normal modes of oscillations. Um, before that, we introduced the concept of displacement waves in a crystal. So uh, we were interested in how how do atom move in a crystal, um, and we found that we can do a continuum approximation and uh, take there's a bunch of many many atoms they displace uh, on average from their mean position, and that displacement waves propagate through the solid uh, which we consider as a continuum solid and not atomistic solid. So today we would combine the idea of normal modes which we developed in the last lecture with that of atomic motion uh, or more specifically uh, atomic vibration in a crystal and this time we would not uh, take the continuum approximation rather we would go with the uh, proper atomistic uh, calculations. So just to give you an overview of the approach we gonna follow to explain the motion of atoms in a crystal. Uh, let me uh, reintroduce uh, this uh, Hamiltonian of a solid which consists of the electronic part the ions or atomic part and the electron ion interaction part. So this part uh, represent um, the total dynamics or the motion of ions or atoms in a crystal and consisting, it consists of two parts, the kinetic energy part, uh, which depend on the momentum of the ions or atoms and uh, on the masses of these ions or atoms. Uh, plus this term which represent the uh, interaction between ions uh, within the crystal from one ion to another or from one atom to another. So in totality this term represent the um, atomic motion in a crystal. Uh, so how do we uh, make, uh, how do we solve for such a Hamiltonian? Uh, we would approach it slightly differently and, and do certain approximations. The first approximation we're going to make uh, to make our life easier uh, is to not consider a three-dimensional solid but rather a one-dimensional solid and uh, this makes the treatment a lot easier to follow. Uh, the next thing we're going to assume that okay we do have a one-dimensional solid in which consists of many many uh, atoms. Um, uh, arranged in a periodic order given by the periodicity of the crystal. Uh, so what we would do is we are going to take only two uh, atoms within this whole chain uh, and just see how does the potential energy between the two at atom, what, what, sh what kind of uh, shape does the potential energy has or what kind of form does this potential energy has. So once we know the potential between these two uh, to neighboring atoms, we can use that information to consider the same um, uh, potential between any two atoms, any two neighboring atoms within the crystal and uh, solve for the whole system. Uh, so we, we already know that what happens to the, what is the potential of two atoms when you bring them closer to each other side that X is the interatomic distance between them. The potential is a Leonard Jordan potential where you have um, this um, kind of a potential where you do have a minima where the bond formation occur or in other words where the solid uh, is formed. So this represents the equilibrium distance, interatomic distance at which the solid is stable and it is formed. So uh, we know this kind of a potential. What we can assume now is that let's say the uh, motion, the temperature is not very, very high or uh, so that those atoms, they can't move uh, much away from this equilibrium position. So their interatomic distance is 
uh, nearby this um, equilibrium interatomic. Uh, normally, this interatomic distance we represent by A, where A is uh, simply the lattice constant or the constant or the distance between the neighboring atoms uh, in equilibrium condition, uh, ideally at zero Kelvin. But at room temperature uh, or reasonable uh, low enough temperature, this displacement, uh, the atoms can get energy and they can dis the interatomic energy can displace from this equilibrium interatomic distance. Uh, and last time, and we already have introduced that if this displacement is small enough, you can uh, represent a linear jaw potential around this area by a parabolic potential given by uh, such a potential where you have a squared potential. Uh, such an approximation is also called as a harmonic approximation. So this potential closely resembles the potential of a spring so that you can think of two atoms or two neighboring atoms bound together by a spring uh, given by a spring constant. And of course the bond uh, strength in turns give you the magnitude of the spring constant. So you can imagine if the bonding energy is large, uh, then this dip would be more deep. And if the dip is more deep, this parabola would a ha have a higher curvature and a higher curvature would mean that the bond is stronger. So this uh, uh, kind of very neat approximation which you can make uh, which can be very valid at room temperature or reasonable temperature. Uh, and such an approximation is called as a harmonic approximation. So now we know the interaction between neighboring atom or the form of interaction between neighboring atom in a one dimensional solid. So we have done some approximation to make our problem easier. So what would we do next is we would take solid as coupled oscillator. So we not only have one pair of these uh, mass spring systems, but rather we have many such, so that uh, each mass spring system is coupled with the neighboring ones on either side. So uh, we would take the lattice as a whole as a coupled harmonic oscillator. And last time uh, in the normal modes um, uh, description, um, I introduced such kind of coupled oscillators, which result into the a formation of so-called normal mode. So uh, the larger the number of uh, coupled oscillators in a system, the larger the number of these uh, modes is. And importantly, those normal modes were such that they uh, uh, belong to the whole crystal and not uh, belong to the whole uh, mass of coupled oscillators and not to a specific mass within the uh, uh, coupled oscillator system. So, so this going to be our approach uh, to tackle this kind of a Hamiltonian, take a one dimensional solid and then take harmonic approximation and then this use that harmonic approximation over the whole um, lattice or over the whole crystal. Repeat some of the, the harmonic approximation quickly. So uh, this linear jaw potential uh, around this point can be expressed in a power series like this uh, where it can be expanded at x equals around x equals to x equilibrium and it's this x equilibrium which is the interatomic distance is basically the lattice constant then this series take a form like that and uh, um, since the first uh, uh, derivative of this potential at, at this minima is zero and you can take the a equals to zero uh, and then we do this definition that the second derivative of the potential, which is the curvature of the potential, is given by kappa, which is kind of a string, a spring constant between these two atoms. Then this potential uh, has this form, which is a, uh, basically a harmonic approximation or a spring, uh, mass spring like uh, system potential. Where the potential rises depending on the difference between the interatomic distance and A, where A is the equilibrium interatomic distance. So if the interatomic distance changes from this equilibrium separation, uh, the potential rises um, quadratically on either side. So the model, how, how would we model the system? 
is we would take this uh, solid uh, one dimensional solid and then we would connect each of the neighboring atoms uh, with a spring um, uh, so that the spring constant is given by a kappa later on we would see that you can really uh, uh, calculate this spring constant of which you have uh, approximated here by harmonic approximation by real property physical properties of solids so let's start this modeling process um, so what I would do is I would start with such a chain of uh, one dimensional atoms and only consider the nearest neighbor interactions so that uh, an atom, a jth atom would only interact with either a j plus one atom or a j minus one atom. And the interaction would be under harmonic approximation, which would mean that um, it's a spring-like uh, potential uh, between the neighboring, these neighboring uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, and the strength of that interaction is given by the spring constant kappa uh, such that uh, the assumption would be uh, all the masses uh, which are connected by these springs are the same and all the bonds or all the uh, this, uh, spring constants are the same as well. So imagine um, if uh, all these atoms are sitting at the equilibrium position, which is just an imagination and um, doesn't normally happen at room uh, at finite temperatures, uh, then you can identify their equilibrium positions. Uh, and the equilibrium position are given by the periodicity of the lattice, uh, which is given by A. So the equilibrium position of uh, the jth uh, atom uh, is represented by capital RJ, where capital RJ is a lattice uh, vector, a real lattice vector, and the length of that vector is equals to A into J, where J is some number, uh, integer, uh, multiplied by A, where A is the lattice constant. So if you can uh, identify origin on a certain lattice point, then this would be the jth lattice point uh starting from the origin um and this distance of this from the origin would be simply given by capital rj uh, which is a product of a with the uh, integer j so these uh, exact points uh, which periodically occur they define the equilibrium position of the jth atom but of course the uh there they would be uh of these atoms from the equilibrium position so we introduce another set of position which is called as the instantaneous position or the position of the atoms at a certain instant and it is represented by x uh, j for example x j would represent the position of the j atom at a certain instant and so does the neighboring um, atoms as well uh, they might be um, displaced from their equilibrium position at any instant of time. So if they're displaced, then the interatomic distances between these displaced atoms might be different because one atom might be displaced differently from equilibrium position than the, its neighbor. So uh, the interatomic distance, which previously was A, can be different. Um, and you can define this instantaneous uh, interatomic distance between the j and j plus 1 th atom as xj plus 1 minus xj, uh, which is a difference of their uh, instantaneous positions. So now you can define the, or uh, you can describe the harmonic potential between um, the j and j plus 1 th atoms uh, at exactly that instant where uh, their position at that instant were given by xj and xj plus 1. And that potential would be simply kappa by 2, which is a spring constant, uh, into the uh, xj plus 1 minus xj, where xj plus 1 is instantaneous position of j plus 1 the atom, and xj is the instantaneous position of the uh, j the atom. The difference would give you the interatomic distance at exactly that instant. And you would subtract that interatomic distance at that instant from the equilibrium interatomic distance, which is A. And if it is uh, zero, uh, if it is exactly the same, 
then there will be no uh, force of spring uh, on either of these masses. But if this interatomic distance is different than the equilibrium separation, then the uh, forces appear and you have a non-zero potential, a non-zero harmonic potential between these two neighboring atoms. And this uh, potential um, varies quadratically as a difference between the in instantaneous instantaneous interatomic distance and equilibrium interatomic distance A. So now in this way, so I found the potential energy, uh, an expression for the potential energy between J and J plus 1 at atom. And of course you can uh, vary this J or all the atoms or vary this index or all the atoms and find the uh, uh, instantaneous potential energy between the neighboring atoms and you sum over all those instantaneous potential energies. So uh, for so I sum over all the j's where j run would run over all the one dimensional lattice. So you, you can change this index until uh, you cover all the uh, neighboring pairs within this uh, um, uh, chain and you, you sum all of them up. And what you would get is the total potential energy of this one dimensional chain of atom under harmonic approximation. So that's a, a nice start from which you can uh, model your problem. So we get the total potential energy expression for the, total, for the harmonic chain. This is also called a harmonic chain because it's a one dimensional chain where the potential is only harmonic potential. Uh, this harmonic potential is better introduced uh, in the term of something which is called as a displacement uh, displacement quantities rather than instantaneous positions. So if you remember in the normal modes lecture, we uh, um, introduce F equals to MA or the Newton uh, or the dynamics of the coupled oscillators in terms of the displacement of each mass from their equilibrium position rather than uh, at their instantaneous position. So I introduced a new set of um, coordinates, uh, which are the displacement coordinates. And the displacement, uh, for example, the displacement of the jth atom from its equilibrium position is represented by del xj, and it would be given by the instantaneous position uh, minus its equilibrium position, which is all also given by capital Rj. So Let's say if this dashed lines would represent the uh, the equilibrium position, and it is currently at, or at a certain instant the j the atom is here, then this the difference between these two position would be um, uh, uh, displacement of the j the atom. And let's say if your x-axis is positive in the right direction, this displacement is a positive displacement. So what we have done is instead instead of these instantaneous position, we have introduced this um, displacement uh, coordinates, and we would frame our equation of motion using these displacement coordinates. So also uh, now find the instantaneous <coughs> position from the displacement displaced position uh, by just adding the displacement with the uh, equilibrium position. So if uh, you know Rj, where Rj would be this uh, equilibrium position, if you add this displacement, you get the instantaneous position. Uh, and you can do a similar um, calculation for J plus 1 at atom. So if you know its equilibrium position which uh, of J plus 1 atom, which is uh, capital Rj plus 1, then you add the displaced uh, coordinate of this particular atom, with its equilibrium position and you get its uh, instantaneous position. Uh, so now I rewrite this potential uh, in terms of these displaced coordinates. Uh, so for xj plus 1, this displaced coordinate is um, rj plus 1 plus uh, del xj plus 1 uh, minus uh, xj would become rj minus uh, del xj minus a whole squared. So I've just replaced these instantaneous position by the um, displaced positions plus uh, their equilibrium position. So uh, Rj plus 1 minus Rj, uh, these are the difference of the equilibrium positions 
and this difference is simply given by e where e is the interatomic distance uh, for equilibrium case so these two cases out with this a and you are left with a simpler form of uh, potential function for the total lattice where you can take any uh, the difference of any two neighboring atoms uh, the difference of their displacements and the difference of the displacement would tell you if there is any potential between these two neighboring atoms if there is no difference then the potential energy is zero uh, otherwise you add up all of these uh, displacement differences square them and you multiply it by a spring constant to get the total potential energy in the system so what we have done is we now have written the total potential energy of this chain of one dimensional atom under harmonic approximation in terms of the displacements of atoms so once you do this uh, now you can write the total lattice hamiltonian which we started with in this form for a one dimensional solid uh, under harmonic approximation and only considering the nearest neighbor interaction so this would be the total form of your um, lattice dynamic hamiltonian or the lattice motion hamiltonian which would contain the uh, kinetic energy part and the potential energy part written in terms of the displacement coordinates so to set my uh, equation of motion f equals to ma um, i would start with this question is let's say if i have an nth atom within this chain so what is the net force on this nth atom uh, of course under the approximation that it only interacts with the nearest neighbors under harmonic approximation so we have already uh, we already know uh, from normal modes lecture that uh, let's say that uh, if this nth atom has a displacement delta x n in the on the towards the positive side and this other atom which is uh, its neighbor on the right hand side x n plus one um, it is also displaced by the same magnitude so if both the displacement are by the same magnitude in the same direction then the spring which is in between them it won't uh, uh, apply any force on either of these masses so in that case if these both these displacements are the same then uh, this this mass which is n plus 1 mass it doesn't apply any mm, harmonic force on this nth mass so what matters is the difference between these two displacement for example if this uh, atom is less displaced from its equilibrium position as compared to this atom so in that case a force would act on nth atom in the left hand side because this spring which is in between these two is compressed inward and that's why the force would be on the left hand side uh, uh, on the nth atom so that's given by uh, so what this expression that the force on the nth atom it depends on the uh, difference of the displacement so let's say if delta x n plus one is smaller then this so this uh, in, is a negative number and which means that the force is a negative force on this system uh, on this nth atom uh, but this nth atom is also interacting with this uh, n minus one atom so you have to add another force term with it uh, and that force term is written like this again it depends on the difference of displacement between the n minus one atom and n atom you can check whether the sign makes sense or not yourself so there is another a second way to uh, derive this uh, force on the nth atom within this one dimensional crystal and that is why the potential 
uh, of the total uh, atomic chain. So the potential of the total atomic chain under harmonic approximation is given by this uh, using the instantaneous position um, coordinates. Uh, then the force on the nth atom is given by the negative of the gradient of the total potential. Uh, and in this case, uh, we specifically ask for the change in the uh, potential with respect to any change in the instantaneous position of the nth atom. And if we can do such a, a derivative, it would give us the total force on the nth atom. So if you do such a derivative, only two terms in this expansion would matter. Uh, the first term which would matter would be corresponding to the j equals to n and the second one for j equals to n minus 1. So you have this derivative with respect to xn of these two terms uh, because all the other terms won't contain xn in them. So only these two terms would contain xn in them and uh, that's why it makes sense to take only those two terms within this summation where j equals to n and j equals to n minus 1. derivative of each of these terms separately. So the first term, if you take a derivative, you have two times the same term again, multiplied by the derivative of this term, which is minus one. So you have a minus over here. A minus kappa by two has been, a kappa by two has been taken common from this uh, bracket. Uh, <clears throat> plus, then you take the derivative of the second term. So you have twice this term, multiply by the derivative of xn with respect to xn and this is a plus one so you have a plus two over here. Uh, you can uh, make this calculation a bit easier by multiplying two in, uh, one over two inside uh, and a minus as well in here so uh, the, these term rearrange into this form uh, by, uh, by, by removing these brackets, uh, these inner brackets. So <clears throat> these are the terms which I have now and I can uh, now make it even simpler because a and minus a cancels out and minus xn and minus xn adds up. So you have uh, such an expression for the uh, force of the total force on the nth atom under nearest neighbor approximation. So it includes these three, three instantaneous positions, instantaneous position of n plus 1, instantaneous position of n and instantaneous position of n minus 1 and it makes sense because the net force would only depend on these three instantaneous positions under nearest neighbor approximation. So these instantaneous positions as uh, I defined earlier can be written in terms of the equilibrium position plus the displacement uh, uh, from the equilibrium position. So if xn is the instantaneous position of the nth atom is given by the equilibrium position of the nth atom plus the displacement of the nth atom. Uh, so Rn would be let's say its equilibrium position delta xn would be the displacement and if you add these two you get its instantaneous position and you can do the same for n plus one at the atom and n minus one at the atom. You put these uh, terms or you replace these into this uh, sum and what you get is something like this. So uh, you can have two, uh, you can rearrange them. Uh, you can subtract rn plus one from one of the rn's plus then you can subtract rn minus 1 from uh, the second rn. So these two terms um, take care of the capital R's. This gives you plus a, this gives you minus a. So both these cancels out and you are left only with these uh, displacements. Uh, you can rewrite them again, multiply k with each of them and what you get is exactly the same kind of expression as you get earlier by just uh, phenomenologically or physically considering the forces on the neighboring uh, from the neighboring oscillators. So either you do it this way or the, you do it this way. We do have the force expression on the nth atom under harmonic approximation. Uh, now we set up our equation of motion which is given by f equals to ma and in this case we uh, ask for the total force on the nth atom equals to mass of the nth atom where m is the same for each atom in the lattice uh, and a n is the acceleration of the nth atom. So we can write the acceleration of the nth atom in terms of the second derivative of its displacement 
uh, coordinate and so if you take the second derivative with respect to time of this displacement coordinate represented by these two dots over here then it should give you then it should be equals to the net force on the nth atom which is given by this expression uh, where I have just sum up these two brackets here to, to get this thing so xn plus 1 xn minus 1 stays the same x delta xn delta xn adds up to minus 2 delta xn so this is my equation of motion and let's try to find a solution of such equation of motion so you have a second derivative with respect to time of a certain delta xn and you have the same delta xn on the right hand side uh, multiply by some kappa which is a spring constant so it looks like um, um, a, an equation of motion uh, for, for a wave-like equation with some extra terms in here uh, so uh, one can kind of uh, ask for uh, a guessed solution or an answered solution which is an indicated guess of a solution so you can immediately tell that okay apart from this factor you can have um, kind of a you can have traveling wave like solution and the traveling wave like solution is given by this thing uh, such a form of solution is um, given by kx minus omega t this is uh, the phase of, uh, of a certain traveling wave which varies with position and time according to k and omega so such would be the case of a traveling wave solution uh, but here we have slightly different situation this would be true for a continuum medium where uh, the displacement continuously varies from point to point but in this case you are only interested in displacement at certain specific locations for example at the lattice points uh, at the lattice position so x would be different in this case x would uh, only matter at these um, uh, specific lattice points so an educated get guess of a solution of such an equation would be such a form where you have uh, the time dependent part given by this part of the phase and this position dependent part of the phase is given by not x but xn where xn is the position of the nth atom because for all other displacement at all other location doesn't make sense uh, so you only look for a traveling wave solution uh, such that the uh, position uh, you look for displacement at specific positions uh, which are basically your latest points so uh, you can represent xn which is the position of the nx atom by a into n uh, where a is the latest constant and n is the, uh, an, an integer representing the number of atoms you are um, considering so this is the kind of answered solution um, I, I can use for uh, this particular case where the medium is not a continuous medium but rather is a discrete medium with a certain periodicity and you can take benefit of this periodicity uh, by making your x position as a discrete position uh, with a certain periodicity of the um, system itself so just to let you know that uh, when you, you take such a solution uh, normally the convention is you can uh, either either you keep omega uh, as positive and then it would mean that k can be either a positive or negative so the convention or you can have the other way around as well but the convention is you take omega uh, as positive so omega which is the time frequency uh, should be constant uh, for each case but k can be negative which would mean that the displacement might be moving in the right direction or the left direction so that's how the convention goes uh, with such a traveling wave solution uh, either this one or like this one so i put this solution into my equation of motion which uh, is here uh, the left hand side what do i get is the second derivative of this this term uh, which is uh, with respect to time and because uh, you only derivate with respect to time so you get uh, omega squared here multiply by mass and uh, a negative sign here because you have uh, two times i over here and the same uh, solution again because it's an exponential solution on the right hand side you write the solution uh, or the displacement for n plus 1 which gives you uh, such uh, a term 
then you write it for n minus 1 you get this term and then you write it for x n multiply by 2 then you get this term now of course i can take ei omega t uh, which is a time dependent part out of uh, common with all three of them so what i've done is i just simply put this in this solution uh, my guess solution into this equation of motion so uh, let's rearrange this uh, the left hand side as it is from here i can take e raised to the power minus i k a as common and if uh, i k a n as common and if i take it out i get uh, this term again uh, and what left inside the bracket is like this so e i k a n uh, has been taken out as a common here uh, these two would cancel out and this equation and i can uh, multiply minus with the other side uh, it gives me such an uh, su such uh, an expression uh, you can expand these exponential into cos plus i signs and cos minus i signs uh, so this uh, gives you uh, because the um, imaginary part would cancel out uh, it, it mm, reduces so such a form uh, now this So you can see how does uh, what does this term uh, gives. So you can uh, by just looking at cos two theta, given it can be written in such a form, and uh, it can be rewritten in this way. So you can extract sine square theta equals to one minus cos two theta by two, and you can easily see that uh, uh, this the relationship between these two if you consider theta equals to k a by two. So this term which is in the bracket it reduces to sine square k a by 2 um, gives you a, a, an easier expression now so you can write omega squared as uh, twice kappa by m sine square term and uh, since we are interested in what omega uh, or the dispersion relation uh, i take a um, square root on either side and what i get is an expression like this so what does all this mean is that we started with a case where we took a one dimensional harmonic chain uh, in which each atom was uh, connected with the nearest neighbors and we solved for such a system uh, considering a special kind of a solution like this uh, which has spatial periodicity in space and what we found out that if you do it like this then in this case the uh, dispersion turns out to be something like this and of course these are uh, this is the dispersion term uh, or in other words the omega and k relationship for normal modes of such a chain of atoms where normal modes mean that each of this omega represent a collective oscillation um, mode of this uh, chain of atoms and it this specific omega doesn't belongs to one atom now rather this omega it re represent a normal mode which uh, is that of the whole uh, chain of atoms so so let's have a look at the consequences of the um, dispersion which we have um, derived using uh, or modeling solid as a one dimensional um, solid uh, such that each atoms uh, in the solid uh, interact with the nearest neighbors uh, the expression so we uh, we had an educated guess of a solution of this form and it gives us um, a dispersion of this form for such a atomic chain uh, so how does the dispersion which we have extracted here looks like and if you plot this dispersion which is the omega versus k plot looks uh, a function like this and as you may already recall uh, due to periodic boundary condition the values of k are not continuous values but rather uh, they are discrete values given by the periodic boundary condition so if l is the length of the total solid then each of these k points are separated by 2 pi by l over here 
nevertheless uh, this dispersion uh, which is represented by these um, lines uh, they are the dispersion uh, of this uh, atomic chain so what does it mean it means that let's say if you choose a specific k value uh, and you find the corresponding omega for that uh, from this plot uh, then you can put both of them in here and it would uh, for and if you use n value uh, those k and omega values uh, it would give you the displacement of um, that specific atom within the lattice and because uh, this uh, frequency represent normal mode so it would mean that a specific omega and k uh, if you put in here you, it can give you the displacement of any atom within the lattice so you, you change your n and you can find the displacement of any atom within this chain which means that the order displacement for a specific omega and k combination uh, uh, are related to each other but why such a uh, form of the solution so uh, if you compare this kind of a dispersion uh, with that of the dispersion we have already derived for elastic wave because in elastic wave we also consider um, displacement but average displacement rather than atomic displacement so um, if we consider solid as a continuum so that you have a displacement wave which is moving through it where on average uh, the atoms within this only this part are displaced from their equilibrium position uh, but there is an average displacement and not, a, and not a, an atomic displacement of specific uh, atoms so if that's the case the dispersion uh, which we got was something like this uh, where omega was directly proportional to k um, by proportionality constant vs where vs is the uh, speed of propagation of such a displacement wave and as you can see these are a linear wave so uh, these are linear functions so such uh, the solution for such a continuous medium uh, and a solution for such an atomistic medium uh, with a certain repetition are completely different uh, so let's see what are the important differences here so another uh, very critical difference between these two dispersion is that it contains an oscillatory function while this is uh, a non-oscillatory linear function so which would mean that this dispersion it repeats itself and it's uh, repetitive uh, in k value because a is constant so it should repeat itself in k uh, so what does it mean that the dispersion which you have derived for uh, atomic chain uh, is periodic in uh, k space or in reciprocal space so what's the periodicity here so if you replace k by k plus minus 2 pi 2 pi by a then uh, you should get the same value of uh, omega here so uh, if k is let's say 2 pi by a so 2 pi by a a, a cancel out 2 pi uh, sine of 2 pi is 0 so basically you, you add as uh, a zero term with your initial uh, um, omega so that's a periodicity if you have but it's not the only uh, value on which it would uh, be periodic it would be periodic for any integer multiple of 2 pi by a as well so that's a periodicity in case space so this function it would repeat itself after 2 pi by a so if you can already see that uh, at let's say the value of this dispersion in the omega value um, at minus pi by a uh, is exactly equals to the value of omega at plus pi by a because uh, the the difference between these k points is 2 pi by a so that it's repeat itself and it would keep on repeating itself um, uh, in the k space so uh, this immediately uh, um, bring into discussion uh, something which is called as a reciprocal lattice vector so where g is something which is defined by 2 pi by a into m in, into multiple so which means that uh, the solution at any k value is exactly equals to a solution at k plus minus capital g where g is a reciprocal lattice vector in this case in one dimension but it can be generalized into three dimensions so the solution uh, or the dispersion uh, is periodic in k by the reciprocal lattice vectors 
and uh, these we, we have already defined reciprocal lattice vectors multiple places in this course so what does it tells you this important result the dispersion is periodic in k and the periodicity is given by the reciprocal space or the reciprocal lattice vector and um, which led you to the conclusion that the unique values of the dispersion only occurs within a certain range so if you choose a range from minus pi by a to plus pi by a you get unique uh, values of the dispersion and as you go out of this region uh, the solutions are repeated again so you can choose this uh, region uh, maybe between 0 and 2 pi by a but uh, by convention is chosen in such a way that uh, it is between minus pi by a to plus pi by a uh, and 0 a is the uh, in 0 is at the center of uh, these unique values so uh, this is something which is called as the brillouin zone or the first brillouin zone in k space which you have already derived so what is the interpretation of this thing that the dispersion that the omega uh, should be exactly the same as uh, of a certain k then k plus g so imagine you have a lambda equals to 4a then it represents k equals to 2 pi by lambda a wave number of pi by 2a and you can plot this wave so you have a one dimensional solid and you have a wave which has a, period, um, uh, a lambda given by 4a so they said that the lambda is given by four times the lattice constant. So uh, if I fit such a value, uh, such a um, function, or uh, such a solution of this uh, um, wave function, uh, then for this atom, the displacement is uh, positive and large. So it would displace towards the positive direction. Uh, for this atom, the displacement is negative, so it would displace in the negative direction. For this atom, displacement again in the negative direction, so it displaces is maximally in the negative direction. These two has zero displacement. Uh, so this uh, lambda, uh, this kind of a lambda would be represented by such motion of atom in one in one dimension. Uh, let me add uh, with this k, which uh, is pi by two a. Uh, a factor of 2 pi by a which is given by this and let's see what happens so you get a new wave vector by adding 2 pi by a with this factor so uh, you get 5 pi by 2 a this uh, new wave vector it represents lambda uh, corresponding to 4 a by 5 and if you plot this uh, lambda wave uh, you get a wave something like this so if you look at uh, this lattice point it has the same displacement towards positive direction by the same magnitude if you consider this one it has again a displacement of zero this one has a displacement of minus one and so on so what does it tell you that i have a wave which was represented by k equals to uh, pi by 2a and if i added 2 pi by a factor with this k i get another k which has exactly the same effect in terms of displacement uh, of atoms as this other wave had so uh, you can keep on adding higher and higher frequency but the unique values and uh, the unique motion of um, these um, lattice point only occurs within the first brilliant zone so an addition of uh, a reciprocal lattice vector uh, won't change the physical situation the, the physically the atomic displacement uh, stays exactly the same so another important consequence uh, which you can immediately see here is that the dispersion relation is non-linear which we already discussed so uh, for the continuum case you had a linear dispersion and this dispersion which you get for atomic chain is a non-linear dispersion so what does it mean actually so let's say if imagine if you can uh, combine a few uh, vibrational modes and you superimpose them and if you superimpose a few k values what you get is uh, such a kind of uh, uh, groups of waves moving along uh, a certain direction. So these are the displacement waves, which would mean that if this uh, displacement is positive, it means that the atoms are displaced towards right. If displacement is negative, it means that they are move, uh, moving or displaced towards a negative x direction. Can so. Uh, so if you combine a few k, uh, k values over here and you superimpose them, you get 
uh, such kind of uh, uh, wave packets. So the nonlinear dispersion uh, has consequences for the motion of such wave packets. So you can define two different velocities for wave packet. One is called the phase velocity, which is given by omega by k. And the second is the group velocity, which is the derivative of omega with respect to k. So the phase velocity is the speed with which a certain phase, for example, this minima, it propagates along, uh, let's say, x direction. Uh, while the group velocity represents the velocity with which this whole group as a whole moves uh, along a certain direction. So if you have linear dispersion like this, these two velocities are exactly the same. So the group velocity and the phase velocity move to the same uh, velocity. And we already found out that that velocity is given by the speed of sound in that medium uh, for a continuum uh, case. Uh, but in the case of um, monoatomic chain of atom, uh, atoms, uh, uh, these two velocities can be different. So the group velocity can be different than the phase velocity depending on uh, which region of k space you are um, considering. So let's see what does this so mean. We take a long wave length limit. So uh, we already know that this region is the uh, unique region for such a dispersion. So uh, in this region, um, I take a, a limit of longer wavelength, which would mean that I'm taking smaller k values. So for smaller k values, the scale uh, is very small. Uh, which means that, in other words, we mean that the lambda is much, much larger than A. So the lambda of the, these um, latest vibrational waves, they, it would be much, much larger. So uh, the neighboring atoms would have displacement in the same directions. So for this long wavelength uh, limit, K has very small values. And if K is very small values, sign, the argument of sign, which uh, depends on K, is very small. So omega is approximately equals to this factor multiplied by Ka by 2, which is the argument of sign. Uh, you can, uh, so 2 cancels out and you, um, you are left with this term multiplied by K. So if you look at uh, this term, which is inside, uh, this is the spring constant. This is the mass of the atoms and A is the lattice constant. All of them can be treated as constant. Uh, so you have omega is approximately equals to a constant multiplied by K. And you can see that you immediately have a linear light dispersion. You can also see it here that for small values of k, these two dispersion, they are similar or exactly the same shape. So from here, you can get the velocity of sound um, uh, uh, in terms of the lattice constant and in terms of the spring constant and the mass of the atoms. Uh, so you have another expression for the velocity of the sound here. If you compare, since we say that these two conditions would be similar at a longer wavelength limit, for which looks like this, then this uh, speed of velocity, uh, or the speed of sound, which you get from this expression, from this dispersion, should be exactly equals to this thing. And uh, this dispersion include rho m, where rho m is the mass uh, density. And the mass density is given by, let's say, if in a unit cell you have one uh, atom and the mass of the one atom is m, so the density of this solid is given by mass divided by a cube. So if you put uh, these things here and you equate uh, these two here, you get an expression between the Young modulus and the uh, spring constant. So, uh, what does it mean? Uh, so, imagine you have this one atomic lattice uh, such that under harmonic approximation you can consider it as a, a spring uh, potential given by this uh, with a spring constant k. So, if the bonding is stronger, then the spring constant is stronger. Uh, which would mean that the uh, young modulus would be larger. What is young modulus? It is the, uh, the determines the strength of the material. So the harder it is to compress a solid in, in by applying a force in a certain direction, the larger is the young modulus. Uh, and if you can easily imagine, if the spring constant is higher, the young modulus will be higher. So that's a, an expression which 
is very handy in um, in relating macroscopic property of solid physical property in this case which is a young modulus with the microscopic properties which are the spring constant between neighboring atoms and the latest constant uh, so uh, the longer wavelength limit it gives us uh, it can help us in relating with the continuum regime which in turn can help you identify a few um, parameters uh, macroscopically Let's take the short wavelength limit. Uh, we can take the short wavelength limit because there is a, um, a a limit on the on the k values, the largest unique k value, and that is uh, these pi by a and minus pi by a. These are the largest values uh, of k you can have, or in other words, these are the shortest wavelength you can have. So taking the shortest wavelength, so uh, these are these wavelengths occur at the boundaries of the brilliant zone which are represented by these dashed lines. So at these k values where k is equal to either minus pi by a or plus pi by a, the omega uh, has a value given by this because sine um, uh, of k a by, by 2, k is pi by a, so pi by a, a, a cancels out. You have sine pi by 2 which is 1, so omega would have maximum value uh, given by this term which is here so this is the maximum omega value which you can have so uh, this is a very strange result it tells you that if there has to be atomic vibrations in the crystal uh, there has to be an uh, there is an upper bound on the frequency uh, of those oscillations so you can't have indefinitely higher frequencies so let's find out what are uh, these frequencies what what are the usual values of these frequencies but before i go into that um, you can easily see here at this value if you take the um, derivative of omega with respect to k at uh, these uh, short wavelength values or large k values uh, the derivatives are zero because these are uh, the dispersion is flat over there uh, which would mean in terms that the um, group velocity is zero so if you make um, if you combine a few k values here and superimpose them uh, to make a, a, a latest wave or a vibrational wave uh, that wave would be a standing wave uh, and not a propagating wave because its velocity is group velocity would be zero so you can uh, so the group velocity at the brilliant at those k values which are close to the uh, brilliance on boundary have zero propagation what does it mean so it means that uh, at the brilliant zone boundary the wavelength uh, lambda which uh, because k equals to 2 pi by lambda and because k equals to pi by a lambda has a value is given by 2a so uh, that wave looks something like this so this kind of wave represent the waves at the uh, brilliant zone boundary so if you have uh, if you consider this minima it would represent that the atom is moving in the left hand side uh, this uh, atom is not moving anywhere at that instant this is um, displaced towards right so and so and so forth so you have as many atoms displaced towards left uh, as towards right uh, which in other words mean that uh, you have like say an incident wave which is a disturbance wave moving uh, propagating along the uh, lattice uh, some of this wave is reflected uh, from uh, these atomic side because the reflected wave they can constructively interfere with each other as we have seen before with the case of an elect uh, electronic wave moving in a uh, crystal uh, so the incident wave and the reflected wave they uh, combine to give you standing waves so there is no propagation just to find out uh, what is the maximum velocity you can have a uh, maximum frequency uh, of these um, uh, latest vibrational waves you can have in the crystal you can uh, find out uh, using this um, function which we derived earlier so you have the young modulus of aluminum given by this uh, you know the uh, um, at atomic constant you can find 
this from the axial diffraction and using this relation you can find the spring constant uh, for aluminum atom between a neighboring aluminum atom given by this you know the mass of the aluminum atom uh, and you can the maximum frequency um, within of vibrational um, in a sol in this solid would be given by this you we already know these two from here uh, you get the maximum frequency value either in the angular frequency form or the linear frequency form these frequencies are in the infrared uh, regime uh, so that's a typical case where uh, the maximum frequency which um, lattice vibrations can have in solid is uh, usually in the infrared frequency regime so that's a kind of a, a order of magnitude analysis of such waves so i would like to discuss a bit about uh, the nature of the normal modes we have um, calculated here so you have a dispersion like this which repeats itself uh, and you have only unique values within the brilliant zone and within the brilliant zone you can have only uh, you can have uh, these um, k values uh, uh, which are um, at uh, discrete values of k possible so if you consider a certain k value um, this would represent a mode of uh, a normal mode of this one dimension solid and for that value you would have a corresponding omega so you would have k and you would have a corresponding omega of k uh, let's say this uh, represent a specific uh, wavelength so this k uh, represents a specific wavelength uh, and that wavelength uh, or that wave uh, would represent uh, a specific uh, oscillation mode uh, of the solid so in this case you have a lambda like this uh, such that these are the displacement um, along the solid at a certain instance uh, and similarly you can choose any other k so if you choose even a smaller k the lambda would be even larger you, you can go to higher k and you would uh, have smaller wavelengths um, with a different oscillation pattern so each uh, k values here represent a certain oscillation pattern of the whole solid and that's why they are called as normal mode so each k value uh, corresponding to a certain omega it uh, represent one mode of the whole solid in which all the atoms within the solid participate in this oscillatory motion uh, and of course you can then think about each of the atom uh, for example each of atom if the solid has many oscillation modes in in it uh, so each uh, atom may oscillate with many different uh, modes at the same time so you can have a generalized solution in which you sum over many many modes uh, but i want to go a bit further uh, so what we did was we we, we looked uh, we looked at the system in a one dimensional setting uh, but you can easily extract this kind of uh, oscillatory motion or displacement motion to three dimensional by uh, considering planes of waves. So let's say if we have planes, so if we only looked at one line of atoms such so that these atoms are displaced from their equilibrium position, but then no, you can consider planes of these waves such so that the whole planes are displaced from their equilibrium position. So the description of displacement uh, which we did for one atom would be exactly similar for the displacement of the whole plane within a three dimensional crystal. So this uh, theoretical description we did before uh, can be easily extended into uh, a three dimension solid. So, uh, in, so then if you consider one such uh, mode of oscillation which are the normal modes this mode would contain a certain oscillatory pattern on of not just one line of atom but rather the whole uh, uh, crystal itself in which the oscillation would be that of the crystal planes uh, atoms in a crystal planes rather than atom uh, along a single line uh, so that was the benefit of uh, so we uh, of doing all the calculation in one dimension because in one dimension it's a lot easier to describe but it can be easily this description can be easily extended into um, uh, three dimension if we consider instead of one atom a whole plane of atoms uh, along that line of a single atom 
next question so, um, I'm going to ask is okay. Uh, there, there can be a different normal mode in the system. Uh, and what we understood that each mode uh, has each normal mode uh, correspond to oscillation of all the atoms, not just one atom. Uh, now the next question is how many different normal modes can exist um, in uh, a certain solid. So, or so to make the problem easier, I would start uh, with a one-dimensional solid, and you can easily extend it to a three-dimensional case. So let's say you have a one-dimensional solid with a length l, uh, so that it contains um, n number of atoms. Uh, if a is the lattice constant, you can easily uh, see that a multiplied by n should give you l, where l is the length of the solid. So you have this dispersion. Uh, and the unique dispersion values only occur within the first brilliant zone. Uh, what are the k values? What are the k modes within um, the first brilliant zone? Uh, because these k values are discrete and they can only occur at a mode separation given by 2 pi by L. So each of these neighboring modes, they are separated by 2 pi by L. This directly comes from the periodic boundary condition. Now we know the total width of the first brilliant zone and the total width of the first brilliant zone is simply given by 2 pi by a. So starting from pi by a to minus pi by a, the total length is 2 pi by a. So now you know the total length, you know the um, length between two neighboring uh, k modes, then you can find the total number of vibrational modes um, within the solid and that would be given by the this total width of the first brilliant zone. Uh, which uh, gives you the total range of unique k values divided by the k space occupied by a single point or the um, so if you do this you have 2 pi by a by 2 pi by l you have l by a where l equals to n multiplied by a uh, is the latest constant a cancels out and this equals to n where capital n is the total number of atoms so in other words if uh, you have as many modes uh, in the system as many number of atoms in this uh, in the solid but remember we have only been considering one mode of oscillation for uh, which is the longitudinal oscillation uh, so that the um, atom oscillate uh, the displacement of atom uh, is along the propagation direction uh, but you can have other oscillation mode. For example, you can not only have oscillation along the propagation direction, but you can also have oscillation perpendicular to it, uh, which gives you the transverse mode. And there can be two possible ways of it. Either it moves in, let's say if that's the z direction, you can either have oscillation along x or you can have oscillation along y. So in total, uh, you can have three different, um, uh, each mode, uh, can then again represent three different modes of oscillation, one longitudinal oscillation and three uh, transverse oscillation of the same frequency. So the total number of vibrational modes then is not n, but rather three times n, because then you have to consider the, the th three degrees of uh, freedom of motion of each atoms within the crystal. So this gives us a fair bit of an idea um, about the number of modes which can exist within a solid. So in this module, we looked at uh, how we can model a one-dimensional crystal, uh, specifically how we can model the atomic uh, vibrational uh, within a one-dimensional mm, solid. Uh, and we, what we did was we, uh, we approximated a one-dimensional solid as a one-dimensional chain of atoms uh, such that each atom interacts only with its nearest neighbor via harmonic uh, potential. Uh, and we solved for the normal modes in such a chain of atoms or interacting atoms. And what we found out uh, is a dispersion of, uh, of a different type than we have already encountered, uh, which we saw in which we saw periodicity of the dispersion. So we no longer get a non-periodic function, but rather we get a periodic dispersion in reciprocal space. Uh, and we uh, observe other uh, peculiar differences, like there is an upper bound on the frequency of these latest vibration. And all this uh, came because uh, we uh, considered 
the um, periodicity of the lattice within our problem.